Okay, <clears throat> good morning. So let's continue our the last stretch of the discussion re relating to uh, carbohydrates, which uh, has to do with polysaccharides. So the first type of polysaccharide that we need to talk about <clears throat> is called cellulose, which I believe we mentioned the last time that cellulose is what we uh, in, in lay terms refer to as dietary fiber. It turns out cellulose is a very important compound structure um, that forms the one of the primary features of the structural components of cell walls of plants. And this structure, let me zoom in a little bit, I encourage you to do the same, um, is that the linkages between the glucoses, this is a homopolysaccharide, meaning that it's only the same repeating unit again and again and again and again. And it happens to be glucose. If you look down, up, down, down, up, down, it's all glucose, down, up, down. And if you pay attention to the type of linkage that exists between the glucoses, this is what makes it deglucose. And because this is going upward, it's actually a beta linkage. And it's starting one on this one and four on the other sugar, one, two, three, four, right? So this is a beta one to four glycosidic bond. And as I mentioned several times in the previous lecture, we do not have in our intestines what we call a beta, galactose, uh, beta glucosidase, excuse me, because it's a glucose to glucose bond. We have a beta galactosidase, which is the one that hydrolyzes lactose, which we call the enzyme lactase, but we do not have the ability to hydrolyze beta 1,4 linkages between neighboring glucose molecules. So therefore, this type of structure will simply transit through our intestines pretty much unscathed. Sometimes microorganisms within the gut may be able to partially uh, get rid of, uh, not get rid of, or partially destroy a little bit of the structure of cellulose, but that's minimal. It turns out that it pretty much trans, uh, transfers and, and travels through the intestines and ultimately accumulates as the rest of the foodstuffs are digested. This is an undigestible polysaccharide. And it simply ends up forming the bulk of the stool that then provides the uh, important beneficial effects of fiber in the diet. As I mentioned, Having fiber in the diet promotes motility, promotes uh, proper health of your gastrointestinal tract because it stretches the walls as the food is passing by, and that then triggers the motility issue. It also improves with the digestion process, so all kinds of beneficial effects of having fiber in the diet, and this is cellulose. If you look at, this, at the, uh, the colored structure on the bottom, Remember, glucose is a six-membered ring, and it forms these chair-like structures, and the beta linkages ensure that everything is equatorial on these, uh, on these chairs, and it turns out that the strands of neighboring strands of cellulose will form these, these uh, you know, aggregates that will align with each other, and it allows for these large aggregate structures to form. And again, because they're undigestible, they ultimately will accumulate within the intestines. So the two, that, the two types of starches that we need to talk about are starting down here on the bottom is uh, amylose is the first one. And the second one is amylopectin, we're going to talk about in a moment. So amylose is one of the major types of starch, digestible starch. And what characterizes amylose is, and it is glucose, bonded to glucose, to another glucose, to another glucose. It's a homopolysaccharide. But in this case, the type of linkage is an alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond. So the enzyme amylase, which we're going to be studying in the lab this week, um, is an enzyme that we have both in our saliva and is also produced by our pancreas, two different forms of the same enzyme. We'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about enzymes. It turns out the body can make different forms. They have differences in their structure. They have slight differences in their composition. But it turns out that ultimately they catalyze the same reaction. They typically are produced by different tissues. And, but they're, then, they're, then they're simply classified based on that tissue distribution. So we have two types of amylase. It's uh, salivary amylase which is why digestion of uh, 
polysaccharides and starches and things of the sort begin in the mouth. Uh, and then it ultimately is finished off by the pancreatic amylase, which we'll talk about also in the context of diagnostics a little bit later. So amylose is a linear polymer, just like cellulose, there's no branching. We'll define what branching is in a moment. But the entire linkage from the beginning until the very end is just a multitude of glucose after glucose after glucose. And they're all linked by an alpha-1,4. So again, down, up, down means glucose. If you follow, this is up, which means that it's D. But notice here, this is pointing downward in the opposite direction. This is an alpha linkage. And then if you look at the next sugar, one, two, three, four, it's an alpha one to four glycosidic bond, okay, as is, as is depicted here. So it turns out that because of that alpha linkage, the previous arrangement that the strands or chains of cellulose could make these more ordered aggregates, in this case, what ends up happening is that these chains of uh, amylose simply start coiling on themselves because the difference in the orientation in three dimensions of the alpha versus the beta linkage doesn't allow for neighboring strands to sort of aggregate with each other. All that happens is that each individual strand ends up forming these coils. And then, you know, and, and, and when you have a sample and you eat, ingest a sample of starch, what's in there is these coils. They're very long, but they form the, these more complicated aggregates in which neighboring coils can interact with each other as opposed to neighboring strands forming um, linear sort of aggregates. So we call this a linear polymer, again, because it's just alpha-1,4, 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 alpha-1,4 from the beginning all the way to the end. Amylopectin, on the other hand, is the second type of starch and what happens in amylopectin is that there is indeed branching. So what happens is that in this type of uh, compound or structure, about every 25 to 30 glucose structures, there's a branch point that takes off from carbon six on whatever glucose happening, it forms another linkage with another glucose, and that is what we call an alpha-1,6 link. If you follow, here's the, and this actually continues forming a chain going in that direction. So multiple chains of glucose, each of them joined by alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds, will sort of link covalently with each other via these alpha-1,6 glycosidic bonds. And if you notice, again, this is the uh, I know, this is glucose down up down right it's D notice that this is going down but this is from one to six on the other chain some random sugar on the other chain so alpha one six linkages will join together multiple chains each of which is joined by an alpha one four linkage and it just keeps going and going and going and it's every twenty five or thirty or so sugars that this type of alpha-1,6 linkage is going to uh, be formed. So it turns out that when you ingest starch, as I've said, the salivary and pancreatic amylases will digest and break down the regular alpha-1,4, alpha-1,4, alpha-1,4 linkages. But there's another enzyme, it's a separate enzyme called a debranching enzyme. That one is the one that is then in charge of breaking down these alpha-1,6 linkages that are going to be holding together the different chains that ultimately form the branch compound. So ultimately, it all gets broken down to pretty much glucose, and the glucose is then absorbed uh, through the intestines, as we'll discuss. So in animals, the starch, both amylose and amylopectin, are planned products. Uh, again, what we call uh, plant starch. Animals produce a uh, equivalent to starch, which is called glycogen. And that glycogen is uh, more reminiscent of amylopectin, meaning that it is also a branched structure. The difference between amylose and amylopectin is that the branching is much more frequent, about 8 to 12 glucose residues. Every 8 to 12 on average, so let's say on average around every 10 sugars, 
there's a, a branch point. So down here, what is trying to represent, if you were to stand back and look at these structures, zoom out, uh, you'll notice that the degree of branching in glycogen is much, much greater. So what that allows is for much greater surface area, much greater compactness, there's much more glucose per gram, it turns out, of glycogen because the branching makes for a much, much, much more convoluted structure that is much more efficient in providing uh, glucose units when the structure is ultimately digested. So glycogen is a critically important uh, structure for our sustenance. It is stored in liver, it is stored in muscle, in kidneys, and other types of um, tissues where there's a lot of metabolic activity, and it provides sources of energy in the form of glucose in between meals, for example. So when you ingest a large carbohydrate meal, let's say, not these days, obviously, but if you're going, well, actually, you can do it in the drive-thru. If you're going to um, Dunkin' Donuts or one of these places and, you know, having a couple of glazed donuts, that's an enormous carbohydrate uh, surge that you're going to get in your intestines. Uh, the excess of the uh, starches that are contained in those foodstuffs, once they are digested and absorbed, the excess glucose that's not utilized by the body, part of it goes to the uh, biosynthesis of glycogen so that you can st uh, store a lot of that sugar for sort of an, an immediate release of uh, glucose whenever you are in between meals and your body and your cells and your metabolism and your brain needs glucose for it to be able to uh, continue doing its functions. So again, it's, it's, it's comparable to amylopectin because of the branching. Notice that amylopectin has less branching. Again, every 25 to 30 or so, this is about every eight to 12, 10 on average, um, sugars of that branching. And then there's a couple of um, heteropolysaccharides that we need to talk about. Hyaluronic acid, you may have heard about. Uh, there's a lot of advertisement of taking this compound together with chondroitin sulfate, which is the other one that I'm going to mention briefly. Uh, these compounds are important in connective tissue. The one shown here, which is hyaluronic acid, is important in uh, lubricating uh, uh, fluid in joints, so the, what's called the synovial fluid that's, that's bathing all of your joints. It's also important in what we call the vitreous humor of your eyes, the, the, the gelatinous material that's inside the, the sphere of your eye that sort of forms the bulk of the volume of what's inside your eyes. Uh, it's kind of this gelatinous material, and it's uh, one of the major components of that is this compound, hyaluronic acid. So it turns out this is a uh, heteropolysaccharide because if you zoom in and you uh, observe, what happens here is that you have uh, distinct sugars, monomers, forming the ultimate structure of the polymer. So if we, if we pay attention to what we have here, this is a down, know that it's bent, but it's still going up over here, down, up, down. So this is glucose, but notice it's amino glucose and it's N-acetyl glucosamine, right? And it's D, right? Because it's pointing up. And then if you notice, this is pointing in the same direction and it's going to one, two, three, four. So this is an, a beta one to four glycosidic bond from an N-acetyl glucosamine. What's the next sugar? This is down, up, uh, down as well. This is glucose, but if you realize there's a carboxylic acid over here, right? It's not CH2OH anymore. So that's actually glucuronic acid, okay? Glucuronic acid. The, um, one of those uh, uronic acids that we talked about and it's the one derived from glucose. That's why it's called glucuronic acid. It's named here as glucuronate because notice, it turns out it's, it's the carboxylate. At physiological pH, carboxylic acids exist in the form of their carboxylates. So it's not uncommon to name these structures uh, more physiologically. And instead of referring to it as uh, D-glucuronic acid, it's better to say D-glucuronate because it's the, it's the form that it actually exists within your bodily fluids and within your body. So if you notice, this piece is actually what repeats. And if you observe the linkage between the, the glucuronic acid and the next N-acetyl glucosamine, uh, 
is again a one, and here it's one, two, and three. So this is going up in the same direction as this one. This is a beta one, three glycosidic bond. So we have diversity not only in the sugars that make up the heteropolysaccharide, we also have diversity in the types of bonds that join the monosaccharides that form the entire structure. So again, to recap, there's a beta 1,4 linkage here that joins the uh, N-acetylglucosamine with the glucuronic acid, and then a beta 1,3 that joins the glucuronic acid with the next N-acetylglucosamine, okay? All right, so the, um, the next structure related in terms of function is chondroitin sulfate, shown here. We call them uh, glycosaminoglycans because um, just like the hyaluronic acid, they contain uh, glucosamines um, as part of, or galactosamines, amino sugars in general. Uh, and in this case, the chondroitin sulfate is a little bit different than hyaluronic acid. In this case, if you observe, this one is very different. It has Yes, it has an N-acetyl, and it's down, up, but this one's up, notice. So this is coming from galactose. And not only is it coming from galactose, there's a sulfate, SO3 minus, bonded to the oxygen, technically SO4 minus if you count the whole structure. That's what makes it a sulfate. So it's an N-acetyl galactosamine for sulfate. It's a very unique structure. Again, remember what I said previously, nature makes very particular things in very particular places for very specific reasons. And for whatever reason, for these compounds to carry out the job that they're meant to carry out, which is being part of the fluids that are in, in you know, connective tissues and things of the sort, they have to have these particular structural features for them to be able to do what they do, right? So here's the second sugar. It's down, up, down. So this is also derived from glucose. It's also a glucuronate because it has a carboxylate over there. So in this case, it's this 4-sulfate uh, N-acetylgalactosamine with the uh, glucuronate. This is the repeating unit. So these two units are what repeats. If you notice, this is the same thing. So they actually repeat in pairs, but each one of the pair is different, right? And then if you look at the linkages, similar to uh, hyaluronic acid, um, this is a beta 1,4. This is a beta 1,4 linkage over here, and this is again a beta 1,3 linkage over here. Okay, so as I mentioned, again, just like the other one, connective tissue is the main place where these types of compounds will, uh, you know, have some kind of, a, of an important role. All right, so the last one, or almost last one, is heparin. Heparin is uh, another compound, those of you who are in the nursing program or uh, anybody, anybody who may be taking care of patients directly, um, sometimes if uh, in MLS, depending on what it is that you're doing, you may be actually analyzing samples involving heparin. So heparin is actually used in the clinic. Um, it can also be used under certain circumstances in an outpatient basis, uh, but not that much. It's, it's more of, a, of an inpatient uh, treatment uh, because it actually requires injection. And it's a naturally occurring compound uh, isolated from a variety of different sources. And it also, if you observe, contains... Uh, these weird sugars, here's a uh, glucuronic acid that has been sulfated, it has a sulfate on position number two, and then that's joined by an alpha-1,4 linkage with another uh, glucosamine that's been sulfated only on the nitrogen, but also on carbon number six. So again, nature goes crazy in, in making these very specific things uh, for, for some very specific reasons. And this is the this is the dimer, and notice how this is going that way and that way, right? It just continues. And um, it's, this one is, the, the, the type of bond is the same throughout. So that's why they're only giving you this, this little uh, pair over here. So it's, it's the two sugars joined by an alpha-1,4, and it repeats alpha-1,4, alpha-1,4, alpha-1,4 in all directions. So as I said, this compound is used as an anticoagulant and uh, meaning that it prevents blood clotting. And it's not uncommon, for example, post-surgical patients, 
um, that are, are bedridden for whatever reason for longer than expected. They may be put on heparin uh, to prevent uh, blood clots forming in their legs because when, if you're not moving very much and you're bedridden, that can be a problem. Um, and then there's a whole, wide, whole variety of different reasons that patients who are in the hospital uh, may need to be on an anticoagulant. There's different formulations of heparin. For those of you, again, who are going to be taking care of patients, you're going to see that there's high molecular weight heparin, low molecular weight heparin, and it comes in all sorts of different concoctions and formulations that are prescribed in different ways. Um, and typically, you'll also learn about what's called a heparin sliding scale. The patient starts at a higher dose of heparin, and then it's one of these things that you can't just take it off and, and you know, stop it cold turkey. You have to sort of slowly take it away, what's called a taper, and you have to start whatever the dose is is at the beginning and then you have to carefully start giving a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less until you ultimately get uh, stop the heparin and then typically as you're tapering the heparin down then you're introducing a more long-term outpatient type of a uh, anticoagulant if that's what's needed commonly have warfarin um, which is also known as Coumadin. So there's all kinds of different protocols for anticoagulation that those of you who will be in the clinics and in the, in the wards of the hospitals and things uh, will be seeing these things on a daily basis. All right, and then um, this is just a little, you know, wrap it up, putting two and two together slide over here, trying to identify uh, what types of linkages. Are we dealing with a hetero or a homopolysaccharide? Uh, you know, if there's any different types of sugars and things of the sort. So if you're looking at this, and if you scan the structures, you'll notice this is down, up, down, and down, up, down, and down, up, down, and down, up, down. So this is all glucose. So this is technically a homopolysaccharide, okay? So we've already identified that all of them are glucose, right? And then the question is what types of linkages are in these sugars, right? So if you observe, you're always gonna focus on the acetal. This is our starting point. This is, they're all D, right? They're all D, because notice this is all going up, right? And then this is going, so, and then because this is going in the same direction as this, this is beta. And then it's one, two, let's see, one, two, three, four. So this is beta one, four. Okay, and then the next one will be, um, here's my acetal, because if you know this is bound to oxygen, and if you follow this line, this is also bonded to oxygen. So this is starting, my starting point is here, right? So now looking at bond number two, and if you notice, this is pointing upward, even though it's sort of bent this way, but the H is going down, so that means that the oxygen is going up. So this is also a beta, but this one is beta one, and it's going one, two, three. So this is beta one, three, okay? And the next one would be, again, up, meaning same direction, and uh, meaning that it's beta, that's bond number three, and it's, this is carbon one, and it's going to one, two, three, four, beta one, four. So, I mean, it, it's, it has to be the same as the first one because it's, it's the repeating unit, right? So this is the sort of the repeating unit over here that repeats. So it's beta one, four, followed by a beta one, three, and another beta one, four, followed by another beta one, three, and so on and so forth. So even though the bonds are different, what determines whether it's a homo or hetero polysaccharide is the sugars. And because they're all the same, regardless of how they're bonded, this is a homopolysaccharide. Okay. All right. So that's chapter 10. So let's question, does this mean you always go from left to right? Yes. You, you go, well, you go from the acetal towards the next sugar. And typically, yes, we, drew, we draw them from left to right because this is how we, you know, typically draw things. Okay. All right. Um, how do I get out of here? All right, so let's go to the next chapter. Oop, I have to go here. So now we're going to start chapter 12. If I can figure out how to get to chapter 12. Here we go. Here's chapter 12. All right, chapter 12 is coming. All right, so chapter 12 is the one that introduces proteins. So um, 
we try to, and, and my apologies, but we tried to, you know, change things around a little bit so that hopefully we could get to proteins before you actually did the proteins experiment in the lab. Unfortunately, that um, was not possible. So um, hopefully you got, you should have gotten enough of the content of the concepts from the lab manual and from the uh, lab exercise. Now it's kind of Gonna, it's kind of gonna going to be sort of you know the, the the cart before the horse situation that you've you already seen sort of a little bit of an introduction in lab. We're now going to expand and give you a lot more information uh, here in the lecture. Okay, so this chapter talks about proteins and uh, peptides, and so this is all new terminology that's going to be uh, introduced in this chapter. So it turns out that proteins, which are derived from peptides, which we're going to define, these play the most diverse roles in living systems than any other class of biological compounds. So carbohydrates are the most abundant structures in nature, but proteins are the most important in terms of function. They are the ones that pretty much provide most of the structural integrity of everything that is alive. And not only that, it is the proteins that are within cells and form part of the structures of cells that carry out all of the functions that are, in, uh, that are you know, critical for the sustenance uh, of, of, of life. Okay? So what they do, amongst the things that they do, they act as catalysts. Every single enzyme, or nearly every single enzyme in the body is a protein of some, of one way or another. Many hormones that carry out important signaling functions are also proteins. The vast majority of transport molecules within cells, across cell membranes, even in nuclear material, is largely carried out by proteins. If you look at the structure of your skin, your tendons, pretty much all your connective tissue lumped together in one big umbrella, most of what's in there and what's giving it structure and function is, in fact, proteins. Other important functions carried out by proteins, things like muscle. As you know, muscle is pretty much pure protein. The, the actin and the myosin are carrying out the, 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 uh, the, the motion functions. The act of actually uh, seeing things, vision, it's a protein that when light hits the back of your eye, the protein is uh, attached to vitamin A, and there's a change in the structure of the vitamin A. And that vitamin A then triggers a change in structure uh, in a protein that ultimately sends the signal to your brain. So we need to talk about what is it actually that makes up the structure of uh, proteins. And it turns out proteins are merely polymers, just like we were talking about in these last few slides of carbohydrates. We have these polymeric carbohydrates that form polysaccharides that have these repeating units which can be hetero or homo polysaccharides. Turns out proteins are always heterogeneous because all of the building blocks that are making them are bonded together in different orders and there's a whole bunch of them. It turns out there's about 20 of these building blocks which are called amino acids because they contain both an amino group and a carboxylic acid group within the same molecule, okay? So there's an acidic organic functional group. Pretty much in nearly every case, it's a carboxylic acid. There are some examples that may contain something other than a carboxylic acid. Those are the very, very few exceptions. And they coexist in the same molecule. So in biochemistry, in the context of what we're gonna be discussing, the most abundant class of amino acids are again what we call alpha amino carboxylic acids. We're gonna see structures in a moment. And there's about 20 of them that up pretty much everything that is known uh, to man. So again, here are the learning objectives that you can uh, read on your own and that will help to guide you as you study for the uh, different modules that are presented in the course. So we're gonna start talking about structure of amino acids, how we classify them, and then it turns out, because they contain both amino and carboxylic acid groups, amines are basic compounds. Carboxylic acids, as their name implies, are acidic compounds. They both coexist in the same structure. So it turns out that pH has an enormous effect on 
the, the net charge and the ultimate structure that these uh, types of compounds display. So when we're calling, when we're talking about these alpha amino carboxylic acids, which make up uh, pretty much the nearly the entirety of all building blocks of proteins, we have to uh, look up, have a reference point. So typically any compound that contains a carbonyl group, remember carbonyl group is the C double bond O, that's typically the reference point. So if that's our reference point, the carbon that's immediately bonded to that carboxylic acid by default, this is a general naming system for organic compounds. When you, whenever you have a functional group of reference, the atom that that structure is bonded to is referred to as the alpha position. In this case, it's carbon. So we call it the alpha carbon. And if you notice, as shown here, that alpha carbon contains, let me erase this, that alpha carbon contains the carboxylic acid. It contains what we call an R group or side chain. It contains a hydrogen, and that also contains the amino group. Four different things bonded to that alpha carbon. So therefore, that alpha carbon is a chiral center, meaning amino acids are chiral structures. There's only one exception, and there's one amino acid in which the side chain or R group is actually hydrogen. So therefore, in that one, there's two hydrogens attached to the alpha carbon. In that instance, the alpha carbon is not a chirality center. There's only one amino acid for which that happens. It's called glycine. We're going to look at the structure in a moment. All right. So all amino acids will have, without exception, an acidic functional group and the amino functional group. So both basic and acidic structures coexist in that compound. However, we also then have to look at what is making up the structure of this side chain, which I said can be as simply as, as, as simple as a hydrogen. That's as simple as it's going to get. And of course, it can be more complex, larger structures. So depending on what the structure and chemical properties of that R group are, is how we classify amino acids. They all have basic and acidic structures as part of their main skeleton. So we're going to talk about some classifications that involve describing them as basic, acidic, neutral, etc. That has nothing to do with the amino and the carboxylic acid functionalities because that's sort of a default part of their structure. We're going to talk about what happens with the R group. So there may be additional amines, additional carboxylic acids, or their lack thereof in those R groups. That's what's going to allow us to then classify them in four different ways, either nonpolar, polar neutral, polar acidic, or polar basic. So let's look at these uh, structures. So this table is one of several from your textbook. This is table 12.1. So I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to point out what I'm uh, describing in terms of um, classification. So again, if the side chain, ignoring the amino and the carboxylic acid groups, which will always be present. And let me say one more thing before I continue. I'm going to zoom in even more here just to point something out. Remember how I said previously a little while ago that Carboxylic acids at physiological pH will exist in their carboxylate form. So notice every single amino acid in this table, the carboxylic acid is drawn as a carboxylate because this is reality. This is how they are found in bodily fluids. It turns out, I didn't mention that previously because it was irrelevant to the discussion of carbohydrates, but now that we're talking about amino acids, amines, amino groups, at physiological pH will exist not as neutral amines. They will be protonated and exist as ammonium ions. Ammonium. Okay. So all amino acids, they're nitrogens. And not only if they have a nitrogen in the framework, which they all do, but if they happen to have a nitrogen in their side chain, with few exceptions, which I'll point out, 
those nitrogens will also be protonated in the form of ammoniums, okay? So that's an important piece of information because that's going to help us in the classification. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's focus on the side chains. So an amino acid is classified as being nonpolar if their side chain, if their side chain is nonpolar. So hydrogen, anything that's hydrocarbon-like, so methyl, isopropyl, here's again hydrocarbon type structure, that one's called isobutyl, this one's called secbutyl, Ooh, I think my pen is on its way out, hold on, let me just change my, bat the wiggle my battery over here, wait, for bear with me one moment, All right, so here's secbutyl. If you notice, sulfur and carbon have very similar electronegativities. So then this side chain is pretty much nonpolar. Here's an interesting amino acid. The side chain wraps around itself and it actually links the alpha carbon to the nitrogen. That one is called proline. We're gonna talk about proline a little bit later. It's a very important amino acid in uh, certain structures like um, um, collagen and other important connective tissue proteins. Here's another one that has a hydrocarbon structure uh, in that side chain. It has a, a, an, an aromatic ring, right? Here's one that has nitrogen. It turns out that for reasons I'm not gonna get into, this lone pair on this nitrogen actually is part of this this is sort of an extended aromatic ring over here. And because of that, that nitrogen is not basic, unlike most nitrogens, okay? So tryptophan is one that is also considered a nonpolar amino acid because that nitrogen is not charged. And this, this small nitrogen, part of this very large side chain over here, sort of gets swallowed by that whole thing and it doesn't really provide much polarity to that side chain. So if you notice, we call these nonpolar, not because they don't have a charge or polarity. Again, the carboxylic acid and the ammonium impart these entities with enormous amounts of polarity, but it's the side chain that we're focusing on when we're classifying them as polar or nonpolar. In this case, it's nonpolar. Okay. All right. The next table actually starts to introduce what we call polar neutral amino acids. So these contain atoms like oxygen and nitrogen and things of the sort, but they are not charged. But however, because they contain these atoms, the structures are considered to be polar. So things like alcohols, right? Here's a primary alcohol, here's a secondary alcohol. I said sulfur and carbon have similar electronegativity. But it turns out that when there's a hydrogen on sulfur, which we call a thiol, you learned about thiols in the lab experiment when you talked about the lead acetate uh, test to detect sulfur. So there's actually two amino acids that have sulfur. We already saw the previous one. Let me go back one slide for one moment. The, uh, one of them is methionine that contains sulfur. This is called a sulfide is the name of the functional group is part of that side chain, that turns out to be uh, nonpolar. In the case of the thiol of the cysteine amino acid, so at the name, this one is, turned, uh, is classified as polar, but it's neutral. Notice there's no charge on the side chain, right? So there's an oxygen in this one. We've already talked about these two. This one has a nitrogen, but it's not an amine, it's an amide. And amides, unlike amines, are not basic. Okay, here's another amide. So this, this is asp uh, asparagine and this is glutamine, okay? Polar neutral. The side chains have atoms that impart it with polarity, but there's no charge on those structures. The next set would be the polar basic amino acids. These, as the name implies, have bases in their side chains. And we're talking about nitrogen containing structures. So here's one that has an ammonium in the side chain, right? This is called lysine. Here's asparagine. This one happens to have a nitrogen that's part of this sort of odd functional group, which we're not gonna get into. But 
Uh, this one or this one are not basic because they're sort of part of this pseudo carbonyl structure, but it's this one that turns out to be able to pick up protons. And that's the one that's gonna then make the structure basic. So again, lysine has an ammonium. This one has this entity, which has a name that I'm not gonna get into. And then this one uh, also happens to have a nitrogen that's part of the structure that is capable of picking up protons. This one's called histidine. And anything that has a nitrogen in the side chain that is capable of picking up protons and acting as a base at physiological pH will exist in a positively charged form. Those amino acids are referred to as polar basic. And then the last two are the converse of that. We would have uh, acidic functional groups in their side chain, which at physiological pH would have lost their protons, and then they would have, uh, they would exist in carboxylate form. And here is uh, aspartic acid and glutamic acid, better referred to as aspartate and glutamate. Again, for the reasons that we talked about earlier, uh, this is most commonly referred to as aspartate. And this is glutamate, okay? They um, are, those names are reflective of the carboxylates that exist in their side chains. So you may have heard of MSG, MSG, monosodium glutamate. So that means that we're talking about this compound. So remember the, the charge on the, on the, top is sort of balanced because this is positive and this is negative. But notice the bottom has a negative charge. So this, when it's, in, when it's negative, it can pair with or associate with an ion. So when that ion is sodium, this is in fact what we call MSG, monosodium glutamate, okay? So there's all this hype about all the bad things about MSG, MSG causes this and MSG causes that. MSG causes nothing, all right? It's a perfectly good, nutrient. I've already had this rant in my lecture before, right? If you have MSG in your kitchen and when you're seasoning your meats and your fish and everything else, you had a little bit of MSG after you add all of your other seasonings, you're going to thank me for it because it gives, enhances the flavor of umami, right? Umami, which is the fifth um, tasting sensation that we have. It's nothing other than an amino acid, which we intake through the diet anyway that happens to be paired with sodium. That's why it's called monosodium glutamate, okay? All right, so that's the amino acids classification. So as I mentioned, because these entities contain amino and carboxylic acids in both their main frame, and in some cases, as we've seen, they can also contain one or the other in their side chain, these acidic and or basic entities will change their structure and their charge depending on the pH in which they exist in. So to kind of remind you, when a structure is contained within a medium whose pH is less than, i.e. more acidic than the pKa of the acid, then the structure will primarily exist in protonated form, meaning having more protons, meaning in their acidic form. Remember, lower pH, meaning more acidic, it will exist in their acidic or protonated form. The converse is true if the, if the structure suddenly finds itself in a medium whose pH is larger than their pKa, then the species will primarily exist in deep protonated, having lost a proton, i.e. their more basic form. So depending on the pKa of the ammoniums and the carboxylic acids, we're now considering both acidic forms of these structures, then we can assess and we can sort of bring it together as to why is it that these compounds at physiological pH, which is around seven, physiological is a little bit higher, 7.3, 7.4-ish, right? But let's use seven as our reference point, which is, is close enough to make the, the determination. Um, uh, 
we can now establish why is it that, as I mentioned, if we go back to these tables, all of these amino acids have the aminos as ammoniums and their carboxylic acids as carboxylates. Okay, so if you if you look out there in Google and in textbooks and on all sorts of places, uh, ammoniums, uh, sorry, carboxylic acids in amino acids have pKa's somewhere between let's say two and four ish. Okay, two and four ish. So let's say let's just put here two to four, just to round it to to pretty whole numbers. So at physiological pH, which let's say it's sort of seven point four, sort of the middle, the midpoint, right? that pH is higher, much higher than these pKa's. So what that means is that those carboxylic acids will exist in their deprotonated, i.e. more basic form. Well, what's that? It's the carboxylate, right? This is why then these amino acids will exist in such form in physiological fluids. What about ammoniums? Ammoniums are the acidic forms of amines. Their pKa's are, let's just for the sake of argument, say it's somewhere between 9 and 13, just to use pretty whole numbers again, okay? So at physiological pH of 7.4, that is lower, lower than 9 to 13. And what does that mean? What that means is then that these ammoniums will exist primarily in their protonated, i.e. acidic form, which happens to be the ammonium. This is the acidic form. So this is now why at physiological pH, these types of, stru of structures will exist as ammonium carboxylates, right? They contain both of those in their structure. Now, anytime you have a compound or structure, doesn't have to be an amino acid, it can be anything. Any structure that has both simultaneously in the same structure, a positive uh, charge and a negative charge that coexist, that is known as a Zwitter ion. So amino acids at physiological pH are Zwitter ions. They have both a positive charge and a negative charge. And this is just the framework. We haven't even talked about what happens if we have amino or carboxylic acid groups in the side chain. Well, it turns out that pretty much the same principle applies, right? So the charges throughout the structure can vary depending on pH and depending on what else may be in that side chain that will have a charge or not, depending on what the pH of the fluid is, okay? So if you extend this notion to higher or lower pHs compared to physiological, if you put an amino acid in a solution that's pH one, again, the pH of the carboxylic acid is around two to four, this one is nine to 13, what happens? This pH is lower than any of them, right? So ev every single uh, structure that is capable of protonating or deprotonating will exist in their fully protonated forms. So this is then, if you zoom in, this is then how, let's say this is glycine, which is that simplest amino acid that I talked about, that the R group is a hydrogen. Notice at pH one, this will exist as the ammonium, this will exist as the fully protonated carboxylic acid. So therefore, if you look at the net charge of that structure at pH one, the charge on the carboxylic acid will be zero because it doesn't have a charge, and the ammonium will have a charge of plus one. So the net charge of this structure is positive. If you look at the structure at physiological pH, this piece has a minus charge, that piece has a plus charge. The net charge is zero. This structure has no charge at physiological pH. If you go to the opposite extreme and you consider what we, what if you have a really high pH, so again, if the carboxylic acid is around two to four and the ammonium is between nine and 13, if you have a really, really basic pH, both entities will exist in their basic forms. What does that mean for the carboxylic acid? The carboxylate charge is negative one. The ammonium will no longer be ammonium, it will be amine, because that's the basic form, right? This has a charge of zero. So this one now has a charge of minus one. Notice how by changing the pH, the structure fluctuates from having a positive charge, passes through no charge, 
And then as the pH progressively increases, it can ultimately acquire a negative charge. So differences in pH, differences in structure, meaning more or less amino or carboxylic acid groups throughout the structure will alter the charge at which these structures will exist in, okay, or will have. Um, so if you look at alanine and you're trying to then predict what is the structure of alanine at pH 1, 7, and 14, again, at pH 1, we're talking about fully protonated, right? So both the carboxylic acid and the amine will be fully protonated. So the way that that one looks would be like this, right? This will continue to exist as it was, but now the amino group will have an NH3 or H3N if you draw it sideways like that, right? And then the, the, the hydrocarbon doesn't change. So the charge on, on the net charge on the amino acid alanine at pH 1 will be a charge of plus one, right? If you consider pH seven, the carboxylic acid will be a carboxylate, but and the amino group will still be ammonium. So at pH seven, this is protonated. This is now deprotonated. And you still have your side chain because it's completely neutral. So at pH seven, this will have, oops, a zero charge because this positive cancels out that negative, okay? And then similar to the previous one at pH 14, this will be fully deprotonated, meaning as you see it with NH2 and no charge, this one will also be fully deprotonated and that will have a negative charge. So at pH 14, what happens is that you have a carboxylate you have an amino with its lone pair. There's a hydrogen here. The side chain is still there. So it's 14, the charge is a minus one, okay? So just like we saw with the alanine, it's a very similar outcome with uh, valine, which is the name of this one. So now we're gonna, we're gonna look at some examples in a little bit. When, what happens when this can also be influenced by pH? And that's when it gets a little bit more complicated, but this is how it actually happens. In physiology, there, you know, when you're dealing with polar acidic, polar basic, et cetera, amino acids, then it's a little bit more of a complicate, more complicated analysis. So this is what this is sort of talking about, starting to talk about anyway. So you learned in the laboratory about the concept of electrophoresis, which is a property, it's, a, it's, a, it's an analysis, uh, an instrumental analysis that can be done on uh, charged structures, on samples that contain charged structures. Um, and when they are amenable to changing the charge on those structures based on pH. So it turns out, and here's the analysis that I was starting to allude to, it's a little bit more complex. Different amino acids, as we saw previously, we talked about ranges. So the pKa of this is 2 to 4. The pKa of that is 9 to 13. It varies by amino acid, the specific value. So different amino acids have slightly differences, slightly different pKa's in their carboxylic acid, their amino group, and the, the side chain if they happen to have any of these groups. So at a given pH, different amino acids may have slightly different charges relative to each other because of these slight differences in pKa. The exact pH at which a given amino acid has a net charge of exactly zero is what is known as the isoelectric point of that amino acid. And each amino acid has a unique isoelectric point, meaning a unique value of pH at which its net charge is exactly zero. So this is going to depend on what's the charge on the amino group that they carry and the carboxylic group that they carry, carboxylic acid group in their main frame, plus the contribution of the acidity or basicity of the side chain if they happen to have a basic or an acidic group in that particular side chain. So looking at the, at the uh, structures that are on the very bottom of the slide, 
again, as I keep mentioning, when there's an additional amino or carboxylic acid group, that will also influence the net overall charge on the structure. So let's consider this is aspartic acid down here on the left. <coughs> And we're going to have very low pH. So again, between one and two, something really low. What happens when it's really low pH? Let's say below all of the pKs of everything that's in there. Everything's going to be protonated at that point, right? So the carboxylic acid in the main frame, the ammonium in the main frame, and also the carboxylic acid in the side chain. If you look at the structure as it is shown there, the charge of this is zero, the charge of this is zero, the charge of this is plus one, right? So the net charge is plus one. What happens if you start slowly increasing the pH? Let's say you now go to a pH that surpasses, it turns out that the pH of the mainframe uh, is a little bit lower than the pH of the side chain, okay? The pKa, excuse me. So if you increase the pH just to the point where you manage to deprotonate the main frame carboxylic acid, but the one in the side chain has not yet been deprotonated. So what happens to the net charge in that case? Well, this is now negative one. This is still positive because we've not reached that uh, pKa yet, right? And this one is also not deprotonated. I mean, meaning fully protonated. So it's still zero. So now the net charge is no charge. This is a perfect Zwitter ion. So when a structure has no charge, it cannot be attracted to anything that's positive or negative, right? Because opposites attract, right? But if it's something doesn't have a charge, then nothing electrical anyway will cause it to move in one direction or the other. So the moment, the pH at which this is exactly what's happening with aspartic acid is the moment at which that charge has, an, has ha, that structure has no charge. That's the moment where any electrical field coming from an external source will have no effect on the ability of that structure to be attracted or repelled by that electrical field, okay? So what happens if you continue to increase the pH and bring it to the point where now this carboxylic acid has been deprotonated as well. So now you have the side chain carboxylic acid and the mainframe carboxylic acid deprotonated. So now we're talking about pH around five, six, something of the sort, right? So when that happens, the net charge on the structure is negative here, negative there, and positive here, right? So these two technically cancel each other out. You end up with a minus one charge. So at that point, it it now acquires a negative charge, and at that point, it can be attracted to literally a positive source of ele electrical field because it's negative, right? This one down here would have been attracted at that low pH to something that's negatively charged because it has a, it has a positive charge. The one in the middle here, the, Zwitter, the perfect Zwitter ion, doesn't matter what you do, it's not gonna be attracted to anything because it has no charge. If you progressively continue and continue to increase and increase the pH, and then you ultimately surpass 13, let's say, now we're at pH 14, everything is deprotonated. So the amine is amine, has no charge, and the two carboxylates are negative. So this now has a negative two charge, okay? So you see how you can, depending on pH, you can sort of do an analysis as to what happens to the structure. It goes from all the way one extreme being positive, it can pa you can manage to make it pass through no charge depending on pH, and then if you continue to change the pH and making it more positive, then that's going to make the charges on the structure more negative, okay? So typically what happens is that um, whenever you have a structure in a pH that is less than, more acidic, then their isoelectric point, as we've already been discussing in another context, they're going to exist in a more highly protonated state. They tend to be in sort of a cationic form, okay? And that's the form that's going to predominate of that amino acid. As you increase the pH beyond the isoelectric point, when the pH is higher, 
then again, you're in the more basic side. That means they're going to primarily exist in a less protonated state, meaning they're going to be in a more anionic state relative to the alternative, right? So it turns out, general guidelines, the isoelectric points of most neutral amino acids is close to neutrality. So close to pH 7 is when these neutral uh, amino acids are going to have um, charges close to zero. They're going to be perfectly zwitter ionic. When you're talking about basic amino acids, the one that have nitrogens in their side chains, it turns out that those are going to be uh, in a zwitter ionic semi-neutral state when their pH is in the six range, be uh, between nine and 11. Because remember, you need to be on the basic end of things because they have a base in their amino acid, in their side chain, which is going to be picking up protons. So you want the, the main frame to be plus on the ammonium, minus on the carboxylate, so that they're neutral, so that they kind of annihilate each other. And then you also want the side chain to have no charge because the side chain is basic. That pH needs to be sort of on the basic side to disallow that amine from picking up protons if it were in a medium that has a lower pH. The converse is true for acidic amino acids. Their points of having no charge is going to be in the acidic range. Again, you want those side chains to be protonated such that they do not bring a negative charge into the whole thing. And therefore, that only happens when your pH is on the acidic side of the pH range. Okay? All right. So if you're looking at a uh, structure here and you're going trying to decide which is the structure that predominates at pH 1. So very low pH, meaning lots of acid in the structure. So what does that mean? The ammoniums, the nitrogens, are going to exist primarily as ammoniums. The carboxylic acids are going to primarily exist as carboxylic acids. They're going to be protonated. So you want a structure at low pH. You're looking for both of these, right? So which one? Let's see. Not this one, because this one doesn't have the ammonium. So this is out. This is deprotonated, so this is out. This one has this protonated, but this one is deprotonated, so this is out. And if you notice, this one has the, car the full carboxylic acid plus the ammonium. So this is pH equals to 1. Okay? This one would be pH around 7. This one would be pH around 14. And what about this one on the far left? Well, it turns out that one doesn't even exist. That one is just a mere cartoon representation of the functional groups that these compounds contain. There's no pH at which this is deprotonated and that one is protonated. It's just not possible. Okay? So just be mindful. You cannot have the carboxylic acid protonated and the amino group deprotonated in, real, in a real-life situation. Okay? They're either both protonated or both deprotonated or one protonated, one deprotonated, okay? But it has to be the carboxylic acid that's deprotonated and the amino group that's protonated. This alternative is physically, impo chemically impossible. All right. So this brings us to what you learned about in the laboratory that pertains to electrophoresis. As we've said, depending on pH, charged particles that whose charges can change with pH will migrate in an electrical field depending on what pH they're exposed to and what charge they have. So in general, ions, if something has a charge, they will migrate in an electrical field. Cations that have a positive charge, they will move to the negative electrode. That electrode is called the cathode. It's called the cathode not because it's negative, because then that wouldn't be compatible. It's, ca it's called the cathode because that's where the cations move to. Okay? So therefore, because the cations, which by definition are positive, neg uh, migrate towards something that's negative, the negative electrode to which the cations are attracted to is called the cathode. 
Conversely, anions, which have a negative charge, they're attracted to something positive. We call that electrode the anode. Again, the anode is positive because it attracts anions. And the name anode comes from the fact that it attracts anions. Okay, it's positive because you want to, the anions to go to that electrode. So electrophoresis is the basis of this phenomenon. It's an important analytical technique that we can use to characterize charged molecules. Now, it doesn't have to be only amino acids. You learned about this technique with amino acids. You learned about the technique, with, in fact, with proteins. Proteins are polymers of amino acids, right? Serum protein electrophoresis, which in which you're taking a whole bunch of proteins that exist in your plasma and you're analyzing them based on their charge by putting the sample in an electrophoresis apparatus that then is going to attract them in different directions based on their charge. There's a buffer that maintains a particular pH, and at that pH, different proteins have different charges based on their structure. There's also the size factor, which does not come into play with, a specific, with individual amino acids because they're all very small, but if you look at your sample of plasma, there's a whole bunch of proteins with a whole bunch of different sizes that also plays a role, okay? So this is what this is saying here, right? Molecular size also affects migration ability. And uh, so it's both, it's a combination of charge and size, ultimately, when, when you have things that have different sizes. When, when you have proteins, uh, excuse me, when you have individual amino acids that um, are pretty much tiny, then the size factor is not really an issue. Bear with me one second. I have to get my dogs into control over here. Sorry. All right. So electrophoresis can be used uh, not only for amino acids and proteins. It turns out structures like DNA and RNA that turn, turn out to also exhibit charges um, can be analyzed using electrophoresis. So you learned about the apparatus in the laboratory. And uh, here's a sort of a little bit of a cartoon depicting the process. So you take your sample. In this case, we have lysine, which is a basic amino acid. We have phenylalanine. So I'm going to put a positive charge on this um, because lysine at physiological pH, uh, again, is going to be positively charged. Phenylalanine is a neutral amino acid, a nonpolar amino acid. This one has a zero charge regardless of, uh, I mean, I'm talking about the side chain, right? And then um, the glutamic acid is an uh, acidic amino acid at, let's say, physiological pH. Uh, this is going to have a negative charge. So assuming that this is uh, bathed in a buffer, that is, let's say, pH 7, in which the main frame uh, amino acids, uh, amino and carboxylic acid groups are going to be as depicted here, including the side chain. So the, the, because there's a side chain in this one, this is going to make this one positive. Because there's an acid in the side chain, it's going to make that one negative. And then here, we're just dealing with the main frame in which the ammonium is positive, the carboxylate is negative. That's why that charge, the net charge is zero. So if you turn this on, and this is my negative electrode, and this is my positive electrode, then what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that the lysine, which, again, let's assume this is being done at pH 7, right? The uh, lysine has a positive charge. Well, what's going to happen to the lysine? It's going to start migrating towards the negative electrode. What's going to happen to the glutamic acid? That's going to start moving towards the positive electrode, right? So the glutamate, which is glutamate, as it is at pH 7, that one is uh, going to be moving towards the anode, right? Because that's the uh, this is the anode. That's the anions are going to migrate to. This is the cathode, right? That's where the cations are going to be uh, migrating to. So the um, what's going to happen is that then you can manage to separate the amino acids based on their charges, okay? And that's then you can you, you know you can stop it and analyze to see if things have migrated enough. You can, there's different ways to visualize it. And then technically, once you've managed to do the separation, literally, this is a very specialized type of paper 
that you simply pull out the paper, let it dry, you add a sort of a developing agent, as I've said, that you can observe what's in there. And then all you're taking a little, a little scissor and you're cutting out this little piece and you're cutting out that little piece and you're cutting out that little piece. That can be isolated. And you can then retrieve and obtain the substance. There's other, t other types of electrophoresis that use a, a gelatinous material. It's called gel electrophoresis. And those actually, instead of running sort of vertically and then horizontally, like shown here, this is sort of a horizontal uh, way. It can also be done vertically. So the instrument, sort of it's like a little box and the gel is placed uh, vertically in the in the and it's sort of like a well and then something's connected up here that's positive something connected down here that's negative the stuff the stuff is added and then th in that case purposely we add we make it all um, negatively charged so the positive is down here and the negative is up here and as you turn things on things start to migrate down the the gel and in that case, it's the size that makes the difference. When you have things that are many different sizes, you know, things will migrate based on size from vertical, from the top to the bottom in the vertical direction, and then you can manage to separate them that way. So it's all based on particles that are charged, exposed to an electrical field, migrating in the direction based on their charge, okay? All right. So... If this is lysine at pH 7, which direction is lysine migrating to? So all you need to do is analyze what is the charge on lysine so that then you can make a determination. So again, at pH 7, we already know this is the structure, right? But we can verify the carboxylate will be carboxylate negative. The main frame amino group will be ammonium. And then the side chain amino group will also be positively charged because it's protonated. So the net charge on this, these will cancel each other out. The net charge on this is positive. Therefore, this is going to be attracted to the cathode, which is the negative electrode in this particular case. So again, you need to be you need to be able to understand these concepts if you're given an image of an amino acid, you know, this is the amino acid whatever it is at this pH, right? If if you're running an electrophoresis uh, experiment at that pH, this is the structure which cat which um uh electrode is it going to be attracted to the cathode, the anode or whatever it is based on the charge, okay? All right. So now let's talk um in the couple minutes that we have, let's start introducing uh these concepts of just like we talked about different levels of structure for carbohydrates, monosaccharides, oligosaccharides, polysaccharides, because they're, they can be polymers, pretty much the same thing applies to proteins um, in this context. So as we've mentioned, the alpha carbon of all amino acids except glycine, in which the side chain is hydrogen, is a chirality center. So those 19 amino acids that are chiral, have a particular structure at that chirality center. It turns out that for whatever reason, nature decided, as we've discussed, that sugars, most of them anyway, the, the critically important, the most abundant ones, the ones mostly used everywhere, nearly everywhere, are D. They have a D as in David configuration at that chirality center. For whatever reason, nature has decided that amino acids, the ones that are incorporated into proteins have an L configuration, pretty much all of them. Now, does that mean that there's no D amino acids anywhere? No, there are, because just as we saw some L sugars in very specific places for very specific reasons, having very specific functions, nature does make particular D amino acids for very specific reasons to carry out very particular functions in very specific places. So how do we classify these as D or L in the context of amino acids? In this case, the carboxylic acid, i.e. carboxylate, is the reference point. Remember, in the sugars, it was the aldehyde or ketone, right? It's always the carbonyl group that's our reference point. And then you let it hang and you observe, it turns out that if you look in nature, the nitrogen, in the case of amino acids, it's not OH, it's the NH2 or NH3 plus at physiological pH. It's the nitrogen that then you focus on to establish if it's D or L. So if you look at nature and you draw these as Fisher projections, the carboxylic acid will be on the top. 
the nitrogen will be to the left, which is what refers to as a as an L amino acid. Remember, this means in reality that this is coming upward like this, right? And these are going down like that, right? That's the reality. This is a Fisher projection. So in the Fisher projection, with the carboxylate pointing up as the reference point, the ammonium will be to the left. That's why it's an L amino acid. And this is what happens with pretty much every amino acid that is out there. So um, I'm going to leave it there. We're, it's 1214 or 1215 as of one second ago. So we will continue on Thursday with the discussion on uh, amino acids and proteins. Everybody have a great afternoon.